to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, today we present the auditory rather than the visual uh, with Pulitzer Prize and Grammy Award winning composer John Luther Adams. Yeah. Uh, he will take us on a sonic journey of the Earth's landscape and his creative process today. Uh, I want to thank the School of Music, Theater, and Dance and the Department of Composition for their partnership in bringing you today's program, along with the support of the program in the environment, or PITE. Uh, yeah, and Michigan Radio 91.7 FM, our regular partner. Uh, John Luther Adams is here in Ann Arbor, actually, uh, on an extended visit. He's here as the William Balcom uh, Residency in Composition. He's been here all week hard at work. Uh, he's been performing and speaking and attending rehearsals to help the students of the University Symphony Orchestra prepare the Midwest premiere of his award-winning piece, Become Ocean. His residency will culminate this evening, as a matter of fact, with a concert at Hill Auditorium at 8 p.m. of said piece, Become Ocean, by the University Symphony Orchestra. Now, the New Yorker describes this work as the loveliest apocalypse in musical history. So you probably shouldn't miss it, and it's free. So please do join the ranks at Hill Auditorium at 8 p.m. this evening. Uh, I think you will find that John Luther Adams brings to the series theme this year, our theme of loom, a fundamental and pressing message through his sonic fabric of our environment and the possibilities of creative impact. And I just wanted, in, in thinking about impact, I had just received an announcement today from our, par our partner, PITE, Program in the Environment. The PITE Club presents the No Impact Challenge. This is a two-week waste reduction challenge for everyone on campus. The challenge is to use as few disposable goods, coffee cups, plastic utensils, tissues, et cetera, as possible for two weeks and those who use the fewest disposable items are the winners. I don't know what you win, I don't know how many winners are possible, but you can get more information at umpite, that's P-I-T-E, club.wordpress.com. Uh, we will have our regular Q&A today in the screening room, so please, if you wanna meet John and ask a few questions directly after his staged product, presentation here, exit the theater, go left, down the hallway, you'll find the screening room, and join us there. And now for a proper introduction of our guest today, I have the co-directors responsible for John Luther Adams' residency here from the composition department. Please welcome Michael Doherty and Roshan Estazadi. Afternoon. John Luther Adams is a living composer who creates unique concert works and installations for indoor concert halls and outdoor spaces like no one else. He lived for many years in the wilderness of Alaska and now lives in the wilderness of New York City. <laughs> yes, here's a composer who's inspired by the natural world and a strong sense of space and place. His music is fresh and relevant to our time. He has won just about every award a composer can possibly receive, and he's been described as many things, including Pulitzer Prize winner and Grammy Award winner. I heard him describe himself on more than one occasion this week as an introverted misanthrope but seldom have I met somebody more thoughtful and uh, invested in sincerity and art and creation. New music is alive and well. You can check out John's music on YouTube and, and iTunes and so forth, and, and there's a lot of great contemporary music being written today. Now, I should tell you a personal thing that John Luther Adams is a huge Mets fan. And so, yeah. <laughs> So right after the concert, he has to get to the TV set to see what happens to the Mets tonight. But we do hope you can come tonight to Hill Auditorium. 
for the Midwest premiere of the monumental and transformative orchestral work, Become Ocean, um, which received the Pulitzer Prize in 2014. We hope to see many of you there. You're going to see three orchestras separated on the stage, playing sounds like you've never heard before. The concert is free, 8 p.m. We hope to see you there. Without further ado, let's hear it for an amazing composer, an amazing person, John Luther Adams. I'm standing alone on a beach, listening to the Pacific. As each wave rolls in, booming, roaring, growling, hissing, I listen to its voice, the unique contours of its rising and falling, its singular crescendo and diminuendo. I listen for the interval between this wave and the wave before it and the one that comes after. I listen as the waves advance and retreat, melding and passing through one another, crashing like cymbals on the shore. 
I listen to the small stones clattering over one another, pulled inexorably back into the unimaginable vastness of water that stretches away toward Asia. I do my best to listen as intently, as deeply as I can. Even so, my mind wanders. A plastic bottle among the rocks reminds me that there are vast islands of garbage drifting far out at sea. A strong gust of wind reminds me of the increasingly capricious weather and the storms that lash this and other shores with growing ferocity. The burning sunlight reminds me of melting tundra and expanding deserts, of diminishing polar ice and rising seas all over the earth. I do my best to refocus my attention, to return only to listening. Yet how can I stand here today and not think of these things? The earth is 4,540,000,000 years old. The entire written history of the human species has unfolded in the 11,700 years since the most recent ice age, a brief moment of geologic time known as the Holocene. Throughout our history, we humans have altered the surface of the Earth. But over the past century or so, we've become an undeniable geologic force, making deep, troubling changes to the Earth and its living systems. Today, a growing number of geologists believe we've left the Holocene and entered a new period, the Anthropocene, in which the dominant geologic force is humanity itself. What does this mean for music? What does it mean for my work as a composer or for any artist working in any medium today? These looming threats to the biosphere compel me to write music that's more than entertainment, more than a personal narrative, or a celebration of the heroic struggle of the individual. But can music be engaged with current events and at the same time detached from them? Can music resonate with the world around us and yet still create a world of its own? When I was younger, I was a full-time environmental activist. In the 1970s and 80s, I worked for the Wilderness Society, the Alaska Coalition, and the Northern Alaska Environmental Center. The small role that I played in the passage of the Alaska La National Interest Lands Conservation Act, the largest land preservation law in history, and in helping prevent destructive dams, highways, mining and oil drilling in Alaska remains among the most satisfying experiences of my life. But the time came when I realized that I had to choose between my life as an activist and a life as an artist. In that moment, I decided that someone else could take my place in politics and no one else could make the music that I imagined but me. So I took a leap of faith in the belief that music and art can matter every bit as much as activism and politics. And over the years, as climate change and other global environmental threats have accelerated, 
And as our political systems have become increasingly dysfunctional, I've come to believe that fundamentally, art matters more than politics. As a composer, I believe that music has the power to inspire nothing less than a renewal of human consciousness, culture, and even politics. And yet, I refuse to make political art. More often than not, political art fails as politics, and off, all too often, it fails as art. To reach its fullest power, to be most moving and most fully useful, art must be itself. If my work doesn't function powerfully as music, then all the poetic program notes, uh, extra musical justifications in the world mean nothing. When I'm true to the music, when I let the music be whatever it wants to be, then everything else, including any social or political meaning, will follow. From the titles of my works, Songbird Songs, In the White Silence, Become Ocean, it's clear that I draw inspiration from the world around me. But when I enter my studio, I do so with the hope of leaving the world behind, at least for a while. Yet it's impossible to sustain that state of grace for long. Inevitably, thoughts intrude. Sometimes I think about people, places, and experiences in my life. Sometimes I think about the larger state of the world and the uncertain future of humanity. Even so, I'm not interested in sending messages or telling stories with music. And although I used to paint musical landscapes, that no longer interests me either. The truth is, I'm no longer interested in making music about anything. Though a piece may begin with a particular thought or image, as the music emerges, it becomes a world of its own, independent of my extra musical associations. In the end, those initial inspirations may remain as a title or a program note, invitations to a listener to find his or her way into the music. However, the last thing I want is to limit the listener's imagination. So if a listener feels constrained by any words I may offer along with the music, then I encourage her to ignore them. And few things make me happier than a listener who hears something, experiences something, discovers something in the music that the composer didn't know was there. It's only through the presence, the awareness, and the creative engagement of the listener that the music is complete.
Thank you. For most of my life, I've made music inspired by the outdoors, but it was almost always heard indoors. Several years ago now, I heard my percussion work, Strange and Sacred Noise, performed in the Anzaborego Desert of California, in the Autumn Woods in New England, and finally on the tundra in the Alaska Range. These experiences were both humbling and provocative for me. In the concert hall, Strange and Sacred Noise sounds big, powerful, overwhelming, even frightening. But outside, a lot of it just blew away in the wind. So after 40 years of making music inspired by the outdoors, but usually heard indoors, it finally occurred to me that it might be time to step outside, to compose music intended from the start, to be performed, heard, experienced out of doors. The result was a nuxuit, a piece uh, for nine to 99 percussionists, which was first performed in the Canadian Rockies on the summer solstice in 2009. Making music outdoors invites a different mode of awareness. You might call it ecological listening. In the concert hall, we seal ourselves off from the world and we concentrate our listening on a handful of carefully produced sounds. We tend to regard any other sounds as interruptions of the music, as intrusions. But outdoors, that's really not possible. So rather than focusing our attention inward, we're challenged to expand our awareness, to, to encompass a multiplicity of sounds, to hear as many sounds as we can hear at once, to hear as far as the ear can hear, to listen outward. We're invited to receive messages not only from the composer and the performers, but also from the larger world around us. In Inuksuit, the musicians are dispersed widely over a large area. Listeners, too, are invited to move around freely and discover their own individual listening points. And it's my hope that Inuksuit may help expand our awareness of the never-ending music of the world around us, transforming seemingly inert space into more fully lived, more fully experienced place.
Inuksut is inspired by the stone sentinels that the Inuit have built for centuries in the windswept expanses of the Arctic. Those landscapes that the Canadians sometimes call the big lonely. And as I composed Inuksut, I imagined each musician and each listener as a solitary figure in a vast open landscape. I thought this was a piece about solitude. What I wasn't prepared for, what came as a total and delightful surprise to me, was the strong sense of community that this piece seems to create. Since its premiere in the Canadian Rockies, it's been performed frequently all over the world. Um, in city parks and wilderness locations and everything imaginable, every kind of site you can imagine in between. On five continents now, we're waiting for our African and Antarctic premieres of Inuksuit. So uh, the piece has really taken on this extraordinary life of its own, completely independent of the composer. And there seems to be something inherent in the piece itself that encourages community. Mounting a successful performance of Inuksuit requires an unusual degree of cooperation among the musicians. You've got all those instruments and all those people spread out uh, over a large space. There's just a lot of lo logistics and cooperation involved. But the active participation of the listener also seems to heighten the sense of a shared experience. Um, I, I've seen it happen a number of times. Everybody is creating their own Inuksuit as they wander through it, and yet towards the end of the piece, we all realize that we're listening. Uh, we're in this heightened state of awareness. We're all listening together. Those stone Inuksuit in the Arctic serve a variety of functions. Some Inuksuit indicate the best route from one place to another. Some mark an especially good place to fish or to hunt caribou. And some Inuksuit are so old that their meanings have been lost in time. But they're all markers of the passing of humans in a vast landscape. And the Inuktitut word Inuksuit translates more or less literally to act in the capacity of the human. After Inuksuit came Sila, the breath of the world. And as in Inuksuit, there is no conductor. Every musician is a soloist. No two musicians play exactly the same part. And each musician follows his or her own unique path through the musical and often the physical landscape of the piece. The same is true for the listener. There's no best seat in the house for Inuksuit or Sila. You can choose to root yourself in one location and let the music move around you, or you can wander freely throughout the performance, following your ears and actively shaping your own experience, creating your own mix of the music. And for me, this relationship between the music and the listener simulates a, a human society in which we all feel more deeply engaged with the world and perhaps a little more empowered to help change it. Making music outdoors has also led me to a new understanding of musical polyphony, what we sometimes call counterpoint. But I now think of polyphony as a community of voices, an ecosystem of sounds. And in a performance outdoors, it's quite often difficult to say exactly where the, the piece ends and the world takes over. So rather than a single point of interest in front of us, every point around the oral horizon is a potential point of interest, a call to listen. 
With characteristically radical elegance, John Cage defined music simply as sounds heard. And the idea that music depends on sound and listening might seem as self-evident as the idea that we human animals are an inseparable part of nature. But both these simple truths challenge us to practice ecological awareness in our individual and our collective lives. Cage's definition of harmony was sounds heard together. And listening to the multiplicity of sounds around us all the time, we come to hear the marvelous harmony they create. Hearing this harmony, we may come to understand the place of our human voices within it.
An Inuit hunter scanning the tundra for game will tell you that you learn the most by watching the edges. For most of my creative life, I've lived far removed from the centers of cosmopolitan culture. Up there in Alaska, I imagined that I could work on the outer edge of culture, drawing my music more directly from the earth. Over four decades, I listened for that music in the mountains and on the tundra, on the shoulders of glaciers and on the shores of the Arctic Ocean, and in the northern forests, learning the songs of the birds. And now I stand here on this beach by the Pacific, still listening, immersed in the music of the sea. At night, as my wife and I sleep, it flows into the deepest reaches of my consciousness. There are moments when it sounds as if the waves will come crashing through the open windows and carry us away. And then it falls to a whisper, and it startles me awake. In these sudden still moments, I'm filled with an exquisite mixture of tranquility and dread. In the morning, I rise and do my best to write down the music that I heard in my dreams. As I listen day after day and night after night, a new sound begins to take shape, vast and amorphous, deep and inexorable. My thoughts return often to the melting of the polar ice and the rising of the seas. I remember that all life on this earth first emerged from the sea. And I wonder if we humans as a species may once again return to the sea sooner than we imagine. Yet if you ask me if I'm composing a piece about climate change, I'll tell you, no, not really. Then is this music about the sea? Yes, well, in a way. But what I really hope is that this music is an ocean of its own, an inexorable sea of sound that just may carry the listener away into an oceanic state of mind. Geologists today are engaged in a lively debate about whether the Anthropocene qualifies as a legitimate geologic epoch. Regardless of the outcome of that debate, we can no longer deny the reality that human impacts on the Earth are unprecedented in our history. There are some who envision a good Anthropocene in which we humans manage to save ourselves and minimize our impacts on the earth through new technology. But blind faith in technology is a central part of what got us into this predicament in the first place. And we cannot simply engineer our way out of it. Others contend that the very concept of the Anthropocene leads us to the inevitable conclusion that it's already too late. Too late for us to change anything. Maybe so, but I believe that even if it is too late to avert disaster, we have both an ethical and I would say a biological imperative to try. The natural order of things is change. Sometimes change is rapid. Sometimes it's dramatic. Sometimes change is catastrophic. From an anthropocentric point of view, the changes we humans have set into motion are potentially catastrophic. Species come and species go, and sooner or later, so will we. But are we really so dead set on doing ourselves in? The most basic animal instinct is self-preservation. Might this existential instinct be enough to pull us back from the edge of the cliff? 
Perhaps this is where biology and ethics converge. Aside from the deep ethical questions raised by our role as agents of extinction for so many other species, I believe we have an ethical obligation to act in our own enlightened self-interest. And as we're finally coming to understand, our own self-interest is inextricably tied to the diversity and the health of the larger biosphere. Unless we humans discover our proper place and learn to live in balance with the larger community of life on Earth, our future looks doubtful. Our survival as a species depends on a fundamental change in our way of being in the world. This is what so many of us in music and art, in science, in education, and yes, even in politics, in every field of human endeavor are working on today. My work is not activism. It's art. As an artist, my primary responsibility must be to my art as art. And yet, it's impossible for me to regard my life as a composer as separate from my life as a thinking human being and a citizen of the earth. If my music can inspire people to listen more deeply to this miraculous world we inhabit, then I will have done what I can do as a composer to help us navigate this perilous era of our own creation. For me, it all begins with listening.